really didn't care for, didn't really, really eat that much prior to this changing climate. And so you have to learn how to process those. You have to learn how to cook them. You know, imagine going into a, a, a grocery store and buying something uh, you know, that, that's a, a Taiwanese delicacy. If, if you don't know how to cook it, you won't know how to eat it. And these people back then were facing the same kind of challenges. Suddenly certain foods that were available uh, 100, 200, 300 years before were no longer available. So they had to figure out how to make a living with a totally new set of recipes, basically. And that was a challenge. Um, the other thing that happened is populations become even smaller, more settled. Uh, in Texas and in the Edwards Plateau area, we now see, uh, rather than projected point styles covering half the state, projected point styles will cover now two or three counties only which is really interesting because it's telling us, again, if we assume that points equal people, points are made by people and points are made in a certain shape by a group of people, by a community of people, and another community will make, make them differently, that's how the equation works, then we can assume that, okay, these people really are decreasing in size, the, the size of the groups is decreasing, and they're becoming more sedentary, which is really interesting because that sedentism then he's starting to point to territoriality. Here we are, only about 4,000 years away from the Pleistocene, and people are becoming territorial. Prior to that, in the, at the end of the Pleistocene, they were running all over the place like crazy people, following megafauna. 4,000 years later, they're competing potentially for territories. An interesting phenomenon. You st suddenly start fighting with each other. We see the increase in the number of cemeteries. We see in those cemeteries the increase of people with weapons uh, injuries, and that's caused by weapons injuries. Totally different phenomena coming about. And then the other thing that happens is the animal and dart continued in use. That, as I said very early on, it's a, like a 10,000 year phenomenon, so that continues in use. Edwards Plateau Church remain important, but the one interesting thing is that this decrease in territory size and the increase in violence uh, among people. What we're dealing with is we're dealing again with this period right here. And we're dealing with from here to there. When you take it back to the climate and you take it back to the issue that drought restricts resources, uh, people then become more sedentary. More sedentism probably is driven by partly by the resources and partly by other people being next to you and the increase in violence among different groups, it starts suggesting to us that some of it is climate driven. Archaeologists like to use climate as an explanation uh, because it's kind of easy and it's hard to disprove. Uh, but it really, all the different lines of evidence that we have point to the fact that climate really has changed dramatically during that time period and it results into increased violence, it results into territories developing, it results, and some of that really comes out of how much food is available for people to gather to hunt and what other group is nearby is competing with you for that food. And that makes sense because when we look across the world at, at traditional societies in the Amazon, in Africa, war starts out initially because of that need for food and competition for food. When you have competition for food, you get violence. When you get violence, you get deaths, you get you know, cemeteries, when you get territoriality all seems to tie into a really neat little package. So, drought, this is what it looks like, but imagine again it, it being 3,000 years long as opposed to just a few months long, right? Uh, what happens as a result of that drought uh, con conditions, the different foods that I mentioned that come about are really dramatically different from megafauna. You know, imagine eating a, a mastodon steak and three years later coming home to a pile of grass. <laughs> I, uh, it's not fun. I imagine it wasn't fun. Mesquite, um, that's a key resource. Uh, lechuguilla, uh, the, the cabbage of the lechuguilla, soto. Uh, the stuff that people make really fine liquor out of. They, they used to make different things out of it. They used to eat it. Uh, but the interesting thing about lechuguilla is it becomes a stable, together with the, the seeds, grass seeds, it becomes a stable, uh, but in a really strange way. And, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. Let me take you from the grass to these. One of the things that happens, and it happens at the site at uh, Cibolo uh, Preserve, and at other sites across Texas, is that 
with the climate change, as climate becomes drier, we start seeing a new technology come about. Remember, resources drive technology. They drove the technology of the spear points or, or dark points becoming smaller. With grass seeds, one of the key things is you can't really pop them in your mouth and you chew them and you know, eat them. You have to grind them. Otherwise, they're really, they have seed coats on them. Uh, they're not that digestible. So you either somehow remove the seed coat or you grind them into flour. Well, they, the people figured out that it's easiest to grind them into flour. There are many other more difficult ways to get the seed coat off. So a new technology appears. It's grinding stones, models, the hand part, and the metapolis, the bottom part. They appear roughly about 7,000 years ago, and from then on, they exist for the rest of human history in Texas. Uh, the smallest versions are on the left. Over time, they grow larger and larger. Uh, and what's interesting is when people, and I'm jumping ahead here, when people finally figure out uh, corn, domesticate corn, and start doing agriculture, grinding stones are even much larger. Because what happens is the size of the mono and matate, there's a relationship between the size of, of those two and how much you can grind. The larger the surface, the more you can grind. In agriculture, because you're producing much more and you're feeding more people, the need for more food is greater. And so the tool size increases. Uh, in these hunter-gatherers, because they were feeding a couple of families here and there, there was no need to mass produce. You were really just feeding your family, and so the size of these tools remains pretty small. And so there's an interesting little relationship there. But again, that's the mono and metat that appears early on uh, in the drought sequence, but then it continues thereafter. What, what is the difference in, in size? I mean, what is the small size and the big size? The, the small size of the handstones, typically it's about three and a half inches by three and a half inches. When you get into the southwest, for instance, Southwest agriculturists, Pueblo agriculturists, you're talking an increase of about nearly eight to tenfold. So it's a dramatic increase. And again, these guys are seed you know, producers and harvesters. The others are agriculturists. They produce large quantities of grain, uh, feed large quantities of people. So it's almost a tenfold increase, which is really interesting. Uh, this is now at that 7,000 year period when the, the Cibolo Preserve site appears on that on the horizon. You know, finally, you know, it, it, we see occupation here. And again, it, you know, it's 5,000 years into the history of, of Texas and the history of the new world, but there's a good reason, and there's a really important time to the climate why it appears now. Uh, again, we have that long drought. Uh, the first occupation that we have at the very, very bottom of the site, roughly about six feet below the surface, we have charcoal. We've dated that charcoal to 7,000 100 to 7,300 years before the present. What happened 7,000 years ago? The start of the drought. When drought hits, what happens? The area where, where there was no drought, like the hill country, becomes drought prone, but areas to the south, like the Chihuahua Desert, the lower Pecos area, where there was a desert to begin with, become even worse. The conditions worsen much more than they were before, and so people that live there and manage to eke out a living, even in the previous normal conditions, you add to that a 3,000 year drought, or the beginnings of a drought, and they realize, well, we can't stand this, we're gonna to have to move somewhere else. What happens too is that a lot of the vegetation that is really well adapted to drought conditions in the Chihuahua Desert, start migrating as the desert migrates north, that vegetation migrates north as well. Among those is the Lechiquilla, we'll come back to that. Okay, uh, so the Maddox hunters out of the desert, you know, for instance, prior to, to 7,000 years ago, archaeologically, we find a lot of signs between the Nueces and the Rio Grande River. Because at that point, there was still rain, uh, you know, disturbed, distributed evenly enough that people could go out and hunt and gather, even away from the river valleys. 7, 000, from 7,000 to roughly about 5,000, maybe 3,000 years ago, the conditions are such that we rarely find a sign, an occupation, out in that desert environment. Why? Because there's almost no water. It, everything's drying up so badly that most people will move into the Edwards Plateau. And the Edwards Escarpment and all those springs that flow out of the Edwards Escarpment and the water table, the, the uh, Edwards Aquifer, that's very deeply seeded, is not being affected by drought because the water source for it is very deep on the ground. And so that's where 
springs continued to flow. So people would gravitate into this Edwards Plateau area, Ed Edwards Escarpment area, and live there literally for the next 3,000 years, venturing out into the river valleys every now and then, but most of the time they're focused on these springs. And, and that's a really interesting phenomenon as well. Together with that, as I said, as, as, as drought conditions grow in the, in the uh, south, uh, that vegetation is moving up. So Soto and Chiquilla, which are related, move up into the Atlas Plateau area. What happens next is we find the site, and, and I know that, that there's a skip, but I'll fill it in. We find the site at Seabolo Creek. Uh, when we first find it, and I hope I'm not giving away secrets, but, but when we first find it, it appears as a pile of burnt rock. There's a little pile here, another pile here. It is sitting roughly three feet below the surface. Uh, right now, it is there are massive piles sitting on top of it, so there's no way for anybody to damage that portion of the site. Plus, we excavated most of it. But we find that roughly about three feet below the surface, it appears as a scatter of burned rock. Burned rock will come up in just a little bit, but that's all we know about. You know, we don't know whether this is the tip of the pyramid, really, and we find something much deeper and much larger below, but we, we decide to investigate. We have enough knowledge to know that burned rock is significant, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So that's the sign. It appears on the, on the horizon, you know, 7,000 years ago. Larger, back to the larger picture. Uh, we are roughly here. This is the Edwards Escarpment, Del Rio, and the lower Pecos River is right here. This area is the, southern, the northern tip of the Chihuahua Desert that is expanding in the northerly direction as the drought expands. So lower Pecos, Edwards Plateau, Edwards Escarpment. When you're living in the lower Pecos, and drought gets worse and worse, would you stay there or would you stay here? And that was basically the decision of the people that were living in the lower Pecos. And what happens is that tip of the iceberg that we saw there, we later find out that it represents really part of the technology that people that live in the lower Pecos were bringing up with them to the Edwards Plateau as they were migrating following that plant right there. So climate changes, plants move north. With it come a group of people who are used to eating that plant because it grew in their native land in the lower Vegas. But the people in central Texas, they were not familiar with that plant. They were not familiar with how to eat it, how to cook it to make it edible. Uh, La Chiquilla and Sotal have these cabbages. This is a, a southwestern group uh, basically harvesting those cabbages, big, huge things. When you cook them down, you get the smaller kinds. But what's key about the cooking is how you do it and how long you do it. Originally, that cabbage is a starch. Starch is not digestible by human beings. However, if you put it into an oven and cook it for 12, 14, 16 hours, low heat, that changes the starch into a sugar. Sugar is highly digestible, making that plant edible. And so what happens is you have a plant moving into a region where people don't know how to deal with it, but following that plant come the people that know how to deal with it. Uh, and so they come up out of the lower Pecos, and I'll tell you why we know that. Uh, they come out of, out of the lower Pecos following this resource and bring with them a technology. With them comes that technology of how to make this plant edible, how to basically take a resource that the local people don't know how to eat, how to consume, and make it consumable. And so that's, that's what you hear. What happens is you basically dig a pit, you fill it with wood, light it on fire, and you throw a bunch of rocks in it on the fire. The rocks literally will turn red hot after a long enough fire. Um, that red hot rock basically stores all that energy that the wood as the wood burns off. It, you know, it's so hot that you touch it, you, you, you toast, basically. And so you, you know, it, it really stores a lot of energy. You take grass, place it on top of the rock, and you put your food on top of that. You take more grass, cover the food, and you put a lid of dirt on top of that. And you leave it alone for anywhere from 12, 14 to 16 hours. So you basically fill up this oven, walk away, come back in two days, you unpack it, and you have 
gone from a starch that's inedible to massive quantities of sugar, basically that are highly edible, sweet, a lot of energy transfer occurring, and it's all because of that slow cooking. These people in the lower pictures figure this out because they lived with that plant for thousands of years prior to this period. And so they came up with the plan and brought the technology with them. And for the first time, Ampasat, the very oldest, 7,000 to uh, 4,000 years ago, at the Cipolo Preserve site, we see the manifestation of this technology. The very earliest people that come up out of the lower Pecos bring this technology up. We have slightly larger part on the left and a smaller part on the, on the right. Again, those are the remnants of basically digging a shallow pit, uh, putting a lot of wood in that pit, burning that wood down while stones are sitting on top of it. Once that's done, you put your food on top of it, you cover it with a lid, basically, and you let it sit. And that transforms in an inedible food into something that's edible and highly nutritious. That's what we see very early on. That technology didn't exist in the rest of Central Texas prior to this time period, at least not to that extent uh, that we see it there. Did you have a question? I did. Is it very obvious right away that those are fire tree farmers? They are in the sense that when, when they're complete like that, you can kind of see the relationship and the shape. Um, if they're disturbed, uh, all you will see is basically pieces of limestone that are angular. Natural limestone tends to have rounded corners because nature you know, sort of rounds it down. When you start seeing pieces of limestone that have angles on them, all sorts of breaks on them, that breakage is a result of heating and cooling. And it's that which is the signal. What happens too is that the more you heat the rock and the more it cools down, the more often you do that to a piece of rock, the rock will eventually break. Interesting physical relationships. Physics comes into here for those of you in high school. Um, <laughs> when, when you take something large and you heat it, its capacity to give out heat is longer. It stores heat longer and it gives out heat longer. As that mass decreases in size, it stores less heat and gives out less heat. Indians figured this out. They're physicists. And we're talking 7,000 years ago. Uh, they knew this relationship, and so what they would do is as the rock would repeatedly be heated and would crack and become smaller, they would take the smaller rocks out and replace them with larger rocks to make sure that the heating capacity of that, of that element, of the rock, continues to be highly effective. And so you literally have jumps of rock which are no longer useful for heating because they're too small. In this case, all those rocks are reasonably large and would have been effective heating elements, but you will see in a minute that that's not the case everywhere on the side. One of the layers of the rock that we see uh, dates slightly later in the side, and I'll come back to this, but it's a pavement. It's literally just probably about, well, not probably, I know it's about 12 to 16 inches thick, and it covers roughly about an area as long as almost from here to the other end of the room. Uh, with mice, we're not quite sure. Uh, but the technology, when, when you go to the, the part of the world in the lower Pegasus where the technology comes from, you really see what sort of the, the evolution of the technology because there, burn rock features, features that are cooking features that are used rock, heated rock, really evolve into these rings. You have these donuts that are usually you know, 30 feet in diameter with a, a little basin in the middle and literally a mountain of rock that's you know, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 inches, sometimes even six feet tall uh, on the side uh, as a donut. And in the middle of it is this depression that's the pit, that's the oven. And all the, all the rock and the rim around it is basically the discard from all these rocks that are broken up and no longer useful. And so that's kind of the peak of the evolution of the technology. We don't see that in the hill country everywhere, but it's out there in science if you know how to look for it. Now, let's get to the people. It's almost said. Uh, how do we know that it's low lower pages groups? I mentioned to you that we know that the technology originates from there, and it, it follows the vegetation. The other thing that we know is projectile points. It's the, the dark points, not sphere points, I'm careful in that, but the dark points. Different dark points, the shapes, are 
made by, by in different parts of the world. The Clovis is one crazy one, and Folsom that cover the entire continent. But typically, other point styles uh, that are made in Texas and in North America are more regionally circumscribed. So it is the case with the Baker and the Bandy points. Both of those points are dark points, but they occur roughly in an area that's maybe six, seven counties large in the area where the lower Pecos, the Pecos River comes into the, the Rio Grande and right around there. And so we know that that's where the group originated because they made these styles of points and, and they really didn't travel out much except during this period of drought. Uh, these points are local to that lower Pecos area, but they suddenly start spreading come 7,000 years ago. And they spread to the north and to the northeast. They show up at our side, at, at the Steve Oak Reserve side. They're clearly not local. Uh, it's clearly being brought in by a group of people who, are, who have this technology on, on how to prepare the, the new food and are bringing with them the hunting tools because you have to hunt while you're here. You don't just come out to eat cabbage, you come out to hunt deer and bison and various other things. So with them come the, the hunting equipment. Both of those styles are typically, typically uh, lower pick styles. Uh, and so they show up with the people. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, uh, they, they bring with them the technology and they they meet a group of people who are totally unrelated to them. They're not familiar with, with eating cabbage. It probably so tall cabbage wasn't on their list of to do things. You know, they'd probably rather have hunted bison, they'd probably rather <coughs> have hunted deer, they'd probably rather have eaten acorns, which is another thing that the central Texas groups are really focusing on, acorn processing, uh, grinding it into a meal, meal uh, washing the tannins out of it, making it edible. Uh, but the, the SOTAL wasn't part of their, their technology, so when these new people come in, they basically have to learn from them. The local people, we know that they're very different because they make very different styles of projector points. We don't have many of them, interestingly enough. We have from the entire side these four fragments. These two are related to each other in Angostura and predate and overlap with the very, very earliest occupation at the site. This is a little bit later, and we don't know what this is. This is a mystery type that could be even older than, than these guys. These are about 8,000, maybe 7,800 years old. This one is about 6,800. This one could be 9,000. We just simply don't know. Um, and, and that's part of the research to be done yet. Um, all have affinities to the periodium because they're lancelet. Uh, they're all fragmentary. The other thing that's interesting is that they're all made out of this dark uh, brown translucent shirt. That shirt is the typical shirt that you get on the Edwards Plateau uh, when you go out hunting for shirt. If there are any flint nappers in the group, you know what I'm talking about. It's really magnificent, uh, sometimes almost like a chocolate brown translucent raw material that's really excellent to play. It keeps an edge when you make a two out of it. And local people knew the resource, made weapons out of that. The non-local people who were coming in from somewhere else were bringing weapons made out of material from that region and really didn't know the, the best raw materials on the Edwards Plateau. So they were not making material, uh, tools out of that. And so we have one of the, one of the really good signatures as a detective that, that we can use to, to identify who's local, who's non-local, and where they come from is to look at the material that they travel with. Because they travel with material in their pockets that comes from their region and will not use usually raw material in a new region until they really become familiar with the distribution of that material. So you really have to play detective in order to get, get to some of these, some of these details. Um, okay, let's go on. So what we're talking about in terms of archaeology, uh, we dive down to about six feet below the surface the 7,000 to 4,000 year period is covered in the very deepest part of the site. Uh, several projector points, if you're paying attention, uh, show up here. Baker Bandy, uh, right there and right there. Those are the ones that are non local coming out of the Lower Pecos. But if you look carefully, there's a number of other crazy points out here, too, that shouldn't belong there. There's a old one here, Landry, that's later, Middle Archaic in time, so it belongs up here. A couple of others that really belong up here. What happens archaeologically? Archaeologically, we walk into a location 
that really you have to imagine it as being a, a village. And that village has, has deposits piling on top of it over years, flooding, which has occurred in this side because you have the creeks there, Mangor Creek, Seagull Creek coming together. All of those things will churn up deposits. So it's really <coughs> rare to see everything in an archaeological site layered like a, a, you know, a layer cave. There is some mixture. So when you look at the distribution of projector points, it's not as clear as you would like it, but nature doesn't behave like a textbook. You know, Things are complicated, so you have to sort it out. And it's really taken us months and months and months of research trying to figure out what belongs with what and, and why. And you can see that you know, this stair step thing here, it shows basically that everything is deposited in a stair step fashion. That is, it's deposited on a landform that's sitting like this, not like that. Behind the sign is a hill. The hill is like that. Stuff flows off of it when it rains, comes down onto the floodplain, and deposits kind of like this initially when it hits the floodplain and then it evens out. On the other hand, on the left hand side of the side, there's floods. It will deposit uh, silt and everything coming back onto the, onto the bottom of the hill. And so suddenly you have this process of forming a side which interfingers different deposits. And it's almost impossible to get that layer of data, you know, definition that you normally see in an archaeological textbook. But you know, if you have experience, and we're, we're gaining still, uh, then you can kind of put it together. Uh, it's not a perfect picture, but it really does sort out really well. Uh, and so that's where we are. We're, we're, the last few minutes, we've been talking really about this portion of the site itself. Uh, let's go on. Um, so the radiocarbon ages. For the next occupation, immediately above it, and so, yeah. um, so this occupation ends about 6,000 years, roughly, I think, right to here. The next occupation starts. The initial one, again, was intermittent visits of people coming out of Lower Pecos using burnt rock parts here and there, but intermittently for roughly about 3,000 years. The next phase of the occupation really changes dramatically. Um, what we see between 5,600 and 3,800, or roughly 4,000 years ago, so 6 to 4,000 years ago, is a really different occupation of landfall. Um, what I mean by that, I'll show you in just a, uh, just a second. But instead of having these isolated parts, you start getting this pavement of bird rock, which really signifies a very different uh, occupation. So instead of having isolated parts here and there on the landscape, you have such an intense use of that landscape that you create so much burned rock, so much of this exhausted burned rock that's no longer usable as a heating element, that you start this sort of discarding it and creating a pavement of rock that you end up living on and, and walking on and working on. And, and so you get this massive deposit, in our case, roughly about 12, 16 inches deep of nothing but burned rock that is discarded from using a bunch of different parts to cook with. All of that signifies a really different sort of emphasis on the use of the land. The more people are coming, staying longer, and cooking more, basically, which is really, really interesting. Now, who are these people? Interestingly enough, part of them are from the Lower Pecos. The Langtree form is the typical uh, form that comes after um, the Bakers and Bandies that I showed you earlier. So basically, a different group of people occupied the Chihuahua Desert, the Lower Pecos, and those guys now do the exact same thing their predecessors did um, a few thousand years ago. But when they come up, when they show up at the site, the site and the region is no longer unoccupied. You don't just get one or two foot of projector points of local origin, but you get a whole complex of these points made, the Lajitas. These are local Edwards Plateau people making these projector points and the two groups now interact. You suddenly see not an open landscape anymore, but a landscape that's occupied by people. And so there, I'm sure there's some negotiations here of, of who owns the, the resources and access to the resources, but we see a totally different dynamic in terms of demographics, in terms of people. Now it's interaction between totally different populations, a local population and a non-local population. Again, the ones on the right are the local people. The raw material they're using is local raw material. The forms on the left are non-local forms, and the raw material is non-local. The other thing you see is not only is there a local population sitting at the edge of the Edwards Plateau, where these Lower Pecos people are coming to, 
But there's also another group of people coming out of central Texas, way up in the hill country, uh, coming down to the edge of the Edwards Plateau. Those people are carrying the Bertinalis point, very typical, very uh, made in large quantities. Uh, but again, they're coming out of a totally different region, uh, coming into this region that now is occupied by local people and is visited pretty regularly by people coming out of the lower Pecos. And then the final interesting piece is this little guy right there. Those are about two inches in size. They're triangular. That's a totally different <coughs> population dynamic. That projectile point is local to the area between the Rio Grande and the Nueces River. It's very common there, together with a toolkit that's very unique to that projectile point. And it represents a South Texas population, every now and then intermingling with that population that is converging onto the site itself. So we have people moving from Central Texas, Lower Pecos, and South Texas onto this region. Uh, and in between it is the local population that is making this other tool form as well. And so things are getting a little crowded. One of the things that we were looking for, and we will look for when we return to the site, um, is whether there's any evidence of uh, violence, intergroup violence. We mentioned the fact earlier that it's under these kinds of circumstances that things start heating up. We don't, do not have a burial at the site. We expect that we, we're not going to find it. But at this time period across the state, you start seeing not just territoriality, but you start seeing uh, evidence for burials, for, for actual cemeteries, not just individual burials, but large cemeteries. Uh, there's one um, not far from San Antonio. It has all, all, almost 260 individuals in it. 16 of them, I believe, are weapons-related deaths. And so you can see that about the same time period that these occupations occur, things are starting to, to heat up in terms of the number of people that are occupying the region, in terms of resource stresses, and in terms of different people coming from different regions competing against each other. And that's an you know, those point styles that are, are not local, basically are evidence. <coughs> and so we were talking about this time period right there, with a whole bunch of different time uh, projector point styles really evident in the region, uh, indicating people uh, coming from different parts of, parts of the state. Now that occupation, as I mentioned, is this, it results in this thick layer of burn rock. The top of it you see right here, and unfortunately the slide is not very good, but in this trench, from here through all the way to the end of it, uh, there's a thick layer from there to there of burnt rock that represents that discarded, exhausted burnt rock that no longer functions as a heating element, and it's accumulated root on that landform over a 2,000 year period, which is short, shorter than the earlier occupation, uh, which tells you that the occupation was very intense. A lot of people were there using that landform very uh, dramatically, very consistently, very systematically, probably in processing cabbage because, Sotal cabbage, because that's really the only sort of technology that we need for our uh, heating elements for. Um, okay, so to, to go back and sort of pull it together, uh, during that second occupation, hot rock cooking was much more intensive. The use of the sign had to be reasonably well organized as well, because you create so much garbage that certain things have to be done in other places. We have the garbage area, which is that burnt rock. We haven't found any of the areas where the actual cooking occurred from which the burnt rock comes from. And because we only looked in this, what, 67, you know, 50 foot wide easement, we figure that it has to be away from that, outside closer to the floodplain of the river. So we're going to be looking there the next time we go back. The other thing is that tool manufacturing, there's living areas. People have to live in houses. We haven't found any signs of that. We know, therefore, that the space that they utilize had to be pretty, pretty reasonably organized. People had to know that, OK, this is my garbage area, and I'm not going to live there. I'm going to live in a different part of the site. And I'm going to be, you know, my houses are going to be over here, and the trees are going to be over there. You know, strangely enough, we, this, this time of stuff comes to us automatically. But prehistorically, that wasn't the case. Prehistorically, people sort of figured this out as they were moving along. And we don't get that kind of organizational space where activities placed in different parts of the site until pretty late in the, history, you know, in the sequence. Most of the times, people live in an area for a week or two or three days, and they don't really care what they do, where they do, because it's not usually in the way. 
But when you start becoming territorial, you start spending more time in the location, then you, you're going to have to worry about that because you don't want garbage to be in your way. You have to sort of organize space. And what we're seeing at this time period is those early signs of space organization, community organization, where different activities are being placed in different parts of that site. Yes? Is there any way of knowing through history where the spent rocks, how far the spent broken rocks would be from where they would have had the ovens? I'd love to know. I'd love to know because that would put me exactly more, more into the area that I'm interested in. Um, logic would dictate that they wouldn't carry things very far. But I, I just don't know. I just don't know. Most sites where we have that are ring rings, where, where the, the spent rock is, is, is forms a ring, there the, the ring is formed right on the edge of the, the, the oven itself. So here's my cooking oven. I just take the burnt rock out and put it right there because that's the least far that I, I have to walk. And so least effort dictates that it can't be terribly far. Uh, so we, we dug in, in this 50 foot wide area. Uh, we found it there, so I'm guessing that just on the other side of the right of way, or the easement, where we didn't dig yet, it's probably where it's going to be. But we, we haven't had a chance to test it, but that's a very good question. Uh, many archaeologists have asked that, and many wish that they would know the answer to that. Yeah. Uh, and so, tool manufacturer, some tool manufacturer, tool repair occurs in there because we're finding pieces of what we call fencing debitage, which is a French term for debris, uh, flaking debris tool to a manufacturer. It occurs among the burn rock. Some pieces of burn uh, uh, tools are in the, in the burn rock as well. So you can get a sense that they threw in there not just the rock, but they threw in there anything else that was useless. So it was kind of a garbage area. We call it a mid, uh, basically a, a fancy term for that. Uh, but again, I would like to know where the original activities were, where the houses were, where, where the original hearts were. Because that's, those are the areas that I think tell